Data is really just a tool, no different from the other vital tools that we have in journalism. Quotes, words, photography. Numbers have been used in journalism since journalism has existed. I think what's different are the technologies that are available to analyze that data and also to then con convey that data to readers. We want to receive information fast, quick, and direct to the point. Data journalism will often have all the other tools of journalism in it. But what separates it out, what makes it different, is that you are finding data sources, you are interpreting those data sources, and you're using them to discover stories that you wouldn't have found otherwise. WikiLeaks changed everything about the way that data was regarded in the newsroom. What made me realize the power of this data was when we took all the instances where at least one person died and put them on a map. Suddenly you see these patterns of roads that were obviously peppered with IEDs, or you can see what happened in Fallujah, all these places where it's impossible for most people to go to report on them, but actually to be able to see the data can tell this very human story. Before WikiLeaks, I guess people wondered what was the point of having somebody working on data in the newsroom. Nobody ever asked me that afterwards. We show people whole data sets, often millions and millions of rows of data. We design it in a way so that it empowers them to find things that are relevant to themselves and to their communities, um, rather than seeing all this data and feeling small and feeling overwhelmed by it. I have a column called Dear Mona where readers will write in with a specific question that they have. One week we had a question asking what was the most common first and last name combination in America. Lots of pieces have been written on the most common first name, lots of pieces have been written on the most common surname, but putting the two together is actually quite statistically difficult. I think readers walked away with some really interesting piece of information about what the most common name is, but I also think it told a bigger story about immigration, the fact that a lot of the top 20 surnames are Spanish ones talks to how much this country has changed. The reason that data journalism is important is that you can do a much better, more accurate job of describing reality if you use data. And when you describe reality better, you create the possibility that you give people information that allows society to function better and that allows them ultimately to lead better lives. How Much is a Limworth is an interactive graphic that helps visually explain that the workers' compensation program in different states pay different rates for the loss of different uh, body parts. A developer on my team named Lena Groger visualized it in a way that was very visceral, almost literally. So some of our really early ideas for this were just like simple kind of cartoon. This was more human, proportional, realistic kind of forms. Those were amazingly creepy. We went back to a more cartoonish approach, and this ended up being our final form for the national average. It helps do the work of a story. So a story can say different states have different rates of workers' compensation, but a reader can sit and click all day and kind of compare different limbs in different states and see which states paid you more money for you losing an arm. I think that journalism is evolving to include readers, listeners, viewers in far more hands-on ways. And I think data journalism is a really powerful part of that. It's not a monologue anymore. It's a dialogue. It's a conversation where users and readers have every day a higher voice. We're able to find stories that I don't think we we're, were able to a few years ago thanks to the technology that we have available to us. We're helping reinvent an entire industry, helping inform people in ways that they were never informed before. I think it's vastly better to be a journalist now. If you look at the kind of stories we're able to write now, if you look at the kind of writing we're able to do, if you look at the data we have at our disposal, it is so much more interesting. It is so much more varied. We will know that we've done a good job on this when people stop using this term when data journalism is so constant that it's just journalism, as it always has been and always should be. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Grove, and I'm the director of a new team at Google called the News Lab. And I'd love to welcome you to our new Google Trends Masterclass session here at the Gen Summit uh, in Barcelona. And I should also welcome our live stream viewers online and also downstairs in the expo. We're really excited to be unveiling the new Google Trends right here at the Gen Summit. Whether or not you've used Google Trends before or not, I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of really the revolution that's happening right now in data journalism. There's more data sets available to journalists today than ever before. There are more tools available to journalists today to analyze and contextualize that data for readers. We really think we're living in, in a fascinating age of insight for data journalism, and at Google, we really want to be a part of that. 
you take a look at the upshot, what David Leonhard and team have built at the New York Times. We talked to David. He said that the building of the upshot has really changed how the New York Times newsroom has thought about using data, not just within the upshot, but across the entire publication. Or you look at The Guardian. The Guardian was the first publication ever to launch a data blog. That really kind of set the tone for major news organizations using data in their reporting. It continues to be a big part of how The Guardian tells stories today. Uh, and you look at some of the sort of new, newer organizations using data journalism, 538 or Vox. These are groups that are using data to kind of give the, the why behind the headlines, to contextualize and explain stories every day using the power of data to tell stories. We're a company that has so much valuable data out there. And you know, our mission is to organize the world's information, to make it accessible and useful everywhere. And so data journalism feels just really in step with, with our mission to help users and, and, and people around the world understand uh, the world around them. But data alone is just data. What you really need to make data sing is context. And so we very much believe that Google's data efforts have to be hand in hand with journalists as we think about how to make Google Trends and, and Google Data valuable to people around the world. I, I lead a team called the News Lab at Google. We're a very significant company, and we're focused on empowering innovation at the intersection of media and technology. So our mission is to empower journalists and entrepreneurs to build the future of media with Google, and we're tackling that mission uh, in three ways, through tools, through data, and through programs. So with our tools, we want to make sure that all of Google's tools for journalism are available to newsrooms around the world and that journalists know how to use them. Pillar two is data, and we're going to talk a lot about that today, but really we wanted to reimagine Google Trends for the audience of media to make it much more valuable for newsrooms around the world. And then lastly, we have a series of programs, and these are really uh, focused on tackling some of the biggest opportunities that exist in media today. For example, we're launching a YouTube Newswire where we can get uh, verified YouTube news clips in front of newsrooms around the world that are useful in reporting versus confusing or unverified. And then we're tackling uh, things like meetups and hackathons with groups like Hacks and Hackers through our Hacks and Hackers uh, Connect program globally, really trying to bring journalists and developers together to collaborate on new ways to tackle the, the fascinating changes that are happening in news. When we started, we wanted to really tackle the biggest project we saw that was going to be useful to journalists right away from Google, and that was Google Trends. About a year ago, the News Lab and the Google Trends team got together and started thinking, how can we make Google Trends better for journalists? And we realized that we couldn't do that just by sitting in a room and getting up on a whiteboard with some Sharpie markers. We wanted to go out and talk to journalists in their newsroom, do some really user-centered research to get a sense for, how can we make this product better? And the result is the, uh, the first iteration of our, our, of our new launch of Google Trends, which just happened yesterday. So I'm going to kick it over to our team to walk Friends, we'll have lots of time for, time for questions. Uh, to begin our presentation, I'm going to bring up Simon Rogers. Simon is our first ever data editor at Google. Came on board about three months ago. He actually founded the Guardian's data, data blog back in 2009. Spent some time at Twitter on their data team and has just come on board Google to really launch and develop our Google data journalism team. We're super excited to have him on board. Mr. Simon Rogers. Uh, we thought it'd be good for me to just talk about the data and what is it. As Steve said, I'm in my third um, month here at Google, so obviously terribly experienced in this data. But I've spent a long time just, you know, so far just looking through it and trying to work out what's interesting and what can we use to tell stories. So I'm going to talk a bit about search data today because this is this unique thing that Google has and how you can use it and how we've used it in a particular visualization to showcase some of the ways that, that it works. So there's some kind of distinguishing features about this data which are really interesting. Um, this is the most obvious, right? The, so the sheer size of data out there. You're talking about three billion searches plus every single day, over a trillion every year. But obviously, in the past, that data has kind of been inaccessible and difficult to use. But the second thing is honesty. Now, I'm going to ask a dumb question here. Who knows which is bigger, galaxy or universe? My daughter emailed me this morning and said, Daddy, which is bigger, galaxy or universe? And I've written a book about space, and for the life of me, I couldn't remember. <laughs> But, you know, so what you do is you take to Google. And on Google, there are no dumb questions. We're kind of honest with our search engine in a way where you're never going to be in real life. And if you can kind of analyze those questions and expose them, maybe it'll start to tell us something about the way the world thinks and the way the world works. And the third thing is something I wasn't really expecting about Google Data, but it's very immediate. It's, it's there as soon as something happens, as soon as a story breaks or there's a big news event out there in the world, People take to Google to find out what's going on or where it's going on or what's happened. And if we can kind of harness that immediacy and make it more real-time, maybe we can bring those things together to, to tell some interesting stories. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about this visualisation. And basically, it represents a year's worth of data around climate change on Google, the kind of things that people ask about climate change, the way that people ask it, and so on. I'm going to try a risky live demo of the actual visualisation now. Uh, here it is. So the first thing to say about Google Data is kind of almost a good place to start saying what isn't it. So what it isn't is personal. I have no idea um, what my mum searched for. What you do get is this kind of aggregated indexed scores. And what that means, you can actually meaningfully compare different places, you can compare different subjects, um, because they're, they're indexed and they're normalised to the kind of proportion of total searches. So for something to be higher than another, it means that proportionally there's more searches on it than there are on something else. So this is about climate change, and this ranking down here, which I hope you can see, are the big issues around climate change which are ranked in order of search interest across a year. So energy's top, recycling, oceans, natural environment, and so on. And that, that kind of ranking is useful and interesting, but this is a kind of a global ranking. But the other cool thing about it is you can look at that data by geography, so you've got globally, or if you can go down to state level, to country level, and even within country level to cities. So we thought, well, let's take that data and compare, say, 20 of the biggest cities in the world to see how they compare on those issues. And you can see how this is, for instance, a ranking of search interest uh, in each of these cities across time. You've got Delhi there is the number one city in the world uh, right now for search interest on the term global warming, followed by Mexico City, Mumbai, Jakarta. And you can kind of see how they how they change over time as well, and how cities go up and down depending on you know, the big stories that happen, the big kind of reaction to events. But the other cool thing about the geography is it kind of makes every place equal. You can meaningfully compare London to Paris or places with completely different populations. And it also means you get these little places which suddenly kind of come up and you might never have heard of them. So for instance, if you're looking at global warming, the top place in the world um, for, for searches around global warming is this little town in Caerphilly in Wales called Istrad Minak, a population of only 13,000 people, uh, which is the number one place in the world for searches around global warming in the most recent year. Now, why is that? Well, when you start delving into it, you see they've had really bad floods there, the local schools have done big projects around climate change and global warming. You can kind of see how that would happen. So being able to compare these little places to the big places is interesting and useful, and it kind of means that everywhere, everywhere is equal. And then if you can bring in questions as well, which was the other thing we wanted to do, you can really start to get a sense of you know, what matters in different places. So these are the top questions being asked about global warming in London. Firstly, what is global warming? What causes global warming? Is global warming real? They're kind of obvious, right? But that's what people want to know out there in the world. And I think often when you read a story, there's a kind of pre-assumed set of knowledge that we all will know about this story, so we all understand it. But actually what this data does allow you to kind of identify those things and work out what do we really know and what don't we know and what do people want to find out. So for the first time, all this kind of data is going to be available. So this is one visualisation we produced um, with Pitch, which was designed to kind of bring some of that data together. So right now, I'm going to hand over to Lisa, who is product manager, who's going to talk about some of the ways that the product is going to make that data more and more accessible to everybody out there in the real world as well. We talked to journalists and newsrooms around the world to figure out what you want from Google Trends, and it came down to three main points. Speed of the data, depth of the data, and breadth of the data. First, on the speed point, let's really care what's happening right now. How can we make this real time? So we spent years of engineering effort, and now, in the new uh, Explore page, we can actually have minute by minute granularity within minutes of a search. This is nearly real time. It's quite awesome. With minute-by-minute minute granularity, we can also identify key moments and events. So we can see exactly when Sergio Aguero scored his uh, winning goal in the uh, Argentina versus Uruguay game. So we're actually collecting so much more data now, and this allows us to go much more in depth and show you much more granular data. So for common searches like this, before we didn't have a lot of data points. And now you can actually see each of these entities over time. You can see each of these people who's searching for them throughout the day. You can also see how they compare. So you can compare if someone's more popular at 7 a.m. or 7 p.m. With, the, with the increase in data that we're collecting, we can show you more niche subjects but are still maintaining a high level of user privacy. For example, pretend you're writing an article about rare birds. So this is the, um, this is the cattle egret. And before, if you would search for it, you would get no data. Have any of you seen this before if you're searching for something rare? Yeah, I see a few hands. <laughs> But now, 
because we have more data, we can actually show search interests, where, who in the world is searching for it, and also all the related searches to this bird. So that actually gives you the context. You can actually write this story about rare birds. And the third point is about um, breadth of data. So at Google, we have three billion searches, but we also have almost half a million hours of YouTube uploads and almost a million news articles published per day. This is a huge data set that we want to incorporate within trends. Using Google's knowledge graph, we're able to determine what each of the news articles, what each of the YouTube videos were about, and actually tie them together with searches. So you now have a holistic view of an event as it happens. So combining speed, breadth, and depth, we're actually able to give you a live, constantly updating trend story feed. This is what's happening right now as a pulse of the internet. We look at what's spiking, and we also look at what's potentially stale or overused. So we show you the most interesting stories as they happen, and then give you the full data context around that. And this is publicly available and completely free. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ronnie, our engineering team lead, to walk you through a live demo. So we've built a bunch of new features into the tool, and I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions uh, later on. So if you go to google.com slash trends right now, this is where you'll land. What we're trying to give you here is an actual view of what's interesting around the world right now. So we launched this yesterday for 28 countries, which you can select uh, in this picker, and we'll be launching additional countries over the next few months. Uh, you also have categories that you can select and filter results specific to those categories. Right at the top, we have the Featured Stories section. So those stories were created by the News Lab and are there as examples of the kind of data and insights that you can pull. So if we scroll down, we're at, we arrive at the Trending Stories feed. This is what Lisa mentioned. Uh, and this is where we're really showing you what's happening right now. So this is really a view of current uh, search traffic. Uh, and we use data search, YouTube, and news uh, to compute this list. And we're ranking our stories uh, according to interest. We're really trying to show the most interesting thing, the, the most spiking things at the top. And we use a combination of the, in, the relative increase in interest and the absolute increase. And you can see that there's an, a huge amount of stories. You can always scroll down more and find more obscure stories that maybe not many people have heard of. And the list is completely dynamic. So if I reload, we can see that the list constantly changes with the new data of what's happening really right now. These show a 24-hour window of the searches around the story. And you can see we detect some stories right as they started uh, spiking, Okay, like this example. Right when it started, we start uh, detecting that something is going on. And other stories have been going on for a while now, and you can still see the pattern around them. You can see that they're dwindling down. Maybe if you write a story about it now, it will spike up back up. So this really gives you the image of where the story is in its timeline. Say you found a story that seems interesting to you, and you want to dive in deeper. Uh, what you can do is click on one of those stories, stories for a deeper analysis of what's going on. This happened right just a couple of hours ago, and you automatically directly see the influence on searches, right? So right when the story started breaking, you see a huge increase in searches uh, because people really want to know what's going on there, what happened, uh, and all that stuff. So um, what you see on this page is really the the holistic view of what this story is about. So we're gonna give you news content to give you context about what the story is. Um, maybe if you just read South Carolina and Charleston, you don't know what happened, but we give you the snippets from news so that you can uh, try to understand what's going on. And below that, we're gonna give you additional data that you might find useful and give you insights on this story. So what we have here is the timeline of interest around the story. So from a couple of days ago up until right now, and the bars here, you can see, um, are the number of articles written so far. So you can see a strong correlation between people writing articles and the interest going up. Uh, in other cases, we, we see searches starting to go up without news articles there uh, yet. And that's an, obviously a great opportunity. Uh, we have a geographical breakdown of areas in the US where the story is searched for. Not surprising, South Carolina is the one where most searches. But interestingly enough, all the, the adjacent states are also searching for the story more than others. Uh, at the right here, we have the trending queries. These are actual queries that people are typing to get more information on the story. And now you want to dive in deeper. So the way to do that on trends is using the explore tool. So the explore tool has been around, around for a while now, but we've added lots of new features to it. So the, the easiest way to get there is by searching just at the top. So I'm going to do a search for shooting. 
We have data from 2004, and this is the, the, the timeline of all searches for shooting since then. And you can see all the spikes correlate to unfortunate incidents uh, that happened around the world. And if you scroll down, we have also a regional breakdown and related topics and queries. So for topics and queries, we show both top and rising, top being the topmost searches, and rising being things that are really spiking right now. We want to look at specifically what happened this last day. And this is where the real-time data comes in. So I'm going to look at past day and really see the strong spike uh, related to this uh, search query. What you can also do is dive in deeper to a specific country or even a sub-region in a country. And you can also compare searches. So I could look at shooting versus, uh, and like, look at the behavior of church, for example. OK, and see that both are correlating quite, uh, quite the same because people are searching for both when they want to hear about this story. If you find some data that's interesting and you want to use it, um, there's some ways to download the data. So one option is to download a CSV version of this report. And another option is to look through for the embed icons we have around the page, where you can get an HTML snippet that you can then embed on your page and get the graphics uh, that you see here. I'm going to pass it over to Danielle, the Trends and Data Manager for News Lab. And she's going to walk you through some examples of uh, things we've already done with data. So in the spirit of our mission statement to collaborate with journalists and entrepreneurs to build the future of media with Google, we've been experimenting over the past couple of months with a couple different partners on various ways that you can use Google data for storytelling. One example that we did just a little bit ago for the UK elections was with The Guardian and BuzzFeed. So with The Guardian, we looked at the top questions asked around various party leaders to get a sense for what was top of mind for people in the region. Um, a lot of time, obviously, these answers are very interesting to politicians, but also for media and to help bring the entire population the information that they're looking for to make the vote. Um, with BuzzFeed, we leveraged our new city-level granularity to combine that into the constituencies that uh, in, in the UK and found that David Cameron actually was the most searched candidate in 237 different constituencies out of about 600. So at a time when the polls were saying that the race was actually r even, on Google you could see that David Cameron was significantly in the lead. This week, The Economist is working on a piece that's about to be published called What Does Africa Google? And here, they leverage the size of Google data uh, to find insights about an entire continent. They also mapped external data on former European colonies with Google Trends to find that there are uh, parallels between what people are searching for, say, in former French colonies uh, compared to former Portuguese colonies. In Germany, Rheinischer Post wanted to find very local, relevant cultural insights around Carnival. So they found a trend that the most searched couple's costume was chocolate and milk. And then the brand Ferrero picked up that trend and posted on social media and found that a ton of users were uploading their own photos of their costumes from Halloween as chocolate and milk. So this really speaks to the accuracy of the data at the very local areas. HLN launched a new segment called When Does Blank Become a Thing? And here they're using the time series data to understand when trends were happening. And then they layered on questions to understand the context behind those trends and why they were happening. So we've been hearing the term transgender a lot lately. We were looking on Google for transgender 450 times more than ever before, and there were thousands of questions that people had about it. Let's take a look at the top five. So they range from what is transgender, what does the Bible say about transgender, how does transgender surgery work, how many people are transgender, and what's the difference between transgender and transsexual. Now that's a look at Google Trends for transgender. So here she's using a data visualization tool that uh, we worked with them to build that we're going to open up uh, eventually to other journalists that they can customize to have on air to represent any Google Trends that you'd like to speak about. We're all very aware still in, from April, the big 7.8 magnitude earthquake in Nepal. So right after this happened, Google mobilized with Mashable to showcase 
the searches around the world where people were searching for helping Nepal. Um, this was to showcase which regions were most aware, and you could see as the time series went on how the world became aware of this horrible tragedy. Um, and then Mashable published in the different regions uh, ways in which people could actually help the victims. And then lastly, um, Time Magazine used Google search data to showcase over time uh, what a person's year looked like through the lens of search. So here they ranked all of their nominees from top to bottom and then uh, highlighted this person, Vladimir Putin in this case, year of 2014, annotated with different related searches for each spike. So in February, the top search is, is Putin married? And then in April, it was Snowden and Putin. And by July, they were searching for Putin and Malaysia Airlines. There's a lot of other data sources that's available that we're working to make open for journalists to use. For example, you could tell a traffic story using Waze data or food reviews using Zagat. You can also use Google Consumer Surveys to uh, understand intent. Just about a month ago now, we released uh, an at Google Trends Twitter handle. So if you aren't already following us, please do. Um, the purpose of this Twitter handle is to simply showcase the possibility of the data. So every day, we're looking for insights and unique ways that you can use Google data for storytelling. We've also recently launched a Google Trends data store on GitHub. So anytime we work with a media partner um, to build a customized data source, after the story is published, we'll upload that data source to GitHub for you all to download and, and take a look or build on top of what the story that was already written. Um, we're also curating data sources and uploading them here as we see, even if we don't have an ask from a media partner. The idea is to really get you the most data um, as possible, even if we're not able to push it immediately um, to the product. So with that, I'm going to bring the team back up on stage to answer some questions. But first, wanted to thank everybody. Uh, we're very honored to uh, launch Trends with you all here at Gen. Um, and thanks for coming. So questions on Google Trends. He asked why we're doing this. Why is Google Trends getting a relaunch? I mean, I think we really feel like Google can play a much better role in the data journalism landscape. We feel like our data is really valuable, but up till now, it didn't quite have uh, the, the qualities that journalists kept asking for, the speed, the depth, the granularity. Um, more broadly, we have this new team at Google, the News Lab, focused on collaborating with journalists and entrepreneurs to really imagine how Google could work together with the media to create new products and opportunities. So that's kind of the, uh, the impetus for the, the launch. If you're five or six million people, will the data that we have available in Google Trends be useful? So the great thing about this data is the you know, ubiquity of Google means that the data, yeah, and especially with the increased kind of amount that we're getting, you can get results from anywhere in the world. And we pulled, if you look, follow at Google Trends, you'll see we pulled trends around things like, say, the earthquake in Nepal, even questions from Nepal about the earthquake afterwards. And there's significant amounts of data there that mean that we can, we can do something useful and interesting with it. So you'd be amazed at the kind of places that you can get data on. How is Google going to make money off of all this Google Trends launch material? Uh, not. All of this data is 100% free. We're doing this because we think that it's really valuable. We think that it creates insights about what's happening around the world in really interesting ways. So Google tra Trends always has been and always will be completely free, not only to journalists, but to anybody who wants to go to google.com slash trends. Is Trends going to be a, a, a news-like product? Uh, we don't view it that way at all, actually. We view Trends as a tool for journalists to use. You know, a lot of the raw data here is interesting, but the context and the reporting around it was, is what makes it really valuable. So we see these trending uh, ads that are on these pages and the tools themselves is, is uh, useful for journalists to use in their stories, not as a, a destination site for news, really. When we were talking about real-time, just how real-time is the data? We have about a 10-minute lag, so from the minute that somebody does a search until it, it appears. It's some, sometimes less even than that, but like something around that, but it's pretty instant. So if you choose a time frame like past day, that will always be the last 24 hours. So even if you embed it and come in in three days, it will still be the last 24 hours from now. And the question was, how exactly does the News Lab and the Google Trends work with media partners? Yeah, so it can happen a number of different ways. Um, for The Economist, they reached out to us and were looking for different ways to use data, and they were the ones to come up with the ideas. Often, because journalists are, have the editorial judgment, they're the ones to have an idea of what they, the story that they want to write, and then we brainstorm 
how we can provide that data or what data would be most valuable for them. And it's, it's a bit of a back and forth. Um, you know, it, so that's how that happened with The Economist. So it's really a two-way street. The question was, how, are, how is the News Lab uh, training journalists around the world how to use things like Google Trends? One, we do have a, a global team that does things like office hours and hangouts, live streams, and, and that answers questions from journalists around the world. Uh, the News Lab is based not only in the U.S., but also in Europe. We have a News Lab lead in the U.K., and we're currently hiring in Germany and France, uh, and we'll go from there. So we're definitely a, a new team, but a team that's growing, and we're also looking for partners. So if you're interested in the media education space or outreach space, we'd love to talk to you at some point during the Gen Summit. For that trending stories widget on the home page of the new Google Trends, you use search, news, and YouTube. What exactly are the data points that we pull from those products and how does that work? We use the Google Knowledge Graph to understand what's happening in each of those clips and then we sort of algorithmically uh, cluster them all together and then figure out statistics about them to figure out what's more interesting. Like, are, is something spiking on one of those platforms or is it maybe more saturated if there are a lot of news articles written about it? So we try to have the most interesting, fresh stories on that streaming page. How do we determine what topics people are searching for as we aggregate search data? Google has the knowledge graph, which is where like, we know about all the topics around the world. Like, we know that there's a thing called, uh, like, there's a thing called Gen Summit, right? And there's a thing called Google. And there's, like, we know all of these topics that exist around the world. And we know also like, how they're connected to each other and all of that stuff. So that's the knowledge graph. And we use that technology to know like, what an article is talking about, what main topics are it talking about, what are the searches talking about. Then we can kind of, as Lisa said, bunch them all together and say, OK, this YouTube, this YouTube spike, this, this search spike, this news article, it's really about the same topic. And that's what we show you. Like if you're searching for President Lincoln, um, we, this is also the same as Abraham Lincoln, the US 16th president. We know that that's all the same entity and we can differentiate that between you know, the president and Lincoln, the car manufacturer, or Lincoln, the town in Massachusetts. So we know how each of those are separate entities and so we can disambiguate what the user is searching for, what the video is about. Great. Well, thank you again for coming today. We would love to get your feedback on Google Trends. If you have questions afterwards or down in the expo, please ask us. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody.